The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond Sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. So, good morning, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, my name's Eric Webb. I work for Acquia. Um, this presentation just give you a little bit of background, I'm sure, for how many of you guys, is this your first camp or first Drupal event? So maybe half, 30 of you. Um, the biggest thing I've always noticed in Drupal events is there's kind of two different roles everything's catered towards. There's the site builders, which is all about getting a site up, out the door, finished. And then there's the developers, where they talk about servers and coding and performance and all that. There's a big middle ground there where site builders, for some reason, don't seem to be expected to do performance work. And I think that's kind of a big, big mistake. Um, so this presentation is really geared towards that middle ground of you don't know code, you don't know command line stuff, you don't need to. You know, there's no reason for you to know that necessarily. But you still should be able to create a high performing fast site. Um, so the couple of things we're going to cover. First of all, obviously I'll introduce kind of my background and my perspective. Um, and then we'll talk about really the most important thing I see to having a pr high performance site as a site builder is just look, looking at modules, knowing what could possibly impact your site. And then once you have those, what to look for after that. Um, and then we'll get a little bit more technical and talk about what are the types of caching in Drupal. Um, and I think this is really beneficial because if you aren't a developer, that seems like a real big black box, right? You put stuff in, you get a web page out, you don't really know what happens in between. Um, so we'll talk about the types of caching, and I think that'll help you understand where you can get the biggest gain, where improvements can actually be made. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit more about Drupal itself and the performance. So a few configuration tricks, some tools that are out there, both in terms of Drupal and outside of Drupal. Um, and lastly, if we have time, um, we'll just talk about kind of the big names on the server side, just so that as a site builder, you kind of know what plugs into what and what all the names are. Um, so first of all, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a senior technical consultant at Aqui. I've been there uh, almost two and a half years now. Um, I focus almost entirely on performance, infrastructure, scalability. So I'm one of those back-end nerdy server guys, but I try to get up here on, on a stage this time. So um, I've been with Drupal for a little over five years now. It's been a good, healthy relationship, so uh, no big fights or anything. Um, and I have about 10 years of experience with Linux and PHP and all this stuff. So I have a little bit more perspective outside of just the Drupal PHP kind of area. Um, a little bit about my background on what gives me perspective here. Um, since I started with Acquia, I've been to about five dozen clients across 25 states. A um, little over 125,000 miles flown, 300 nights in hotels. A uh, very supportive wife that helps me uh, make all this happen. A little round of applause for her. Um, so all these blue dots are all the different clients I've had. So you can see all over the place from, you know, small town, Gulf, Mississippi, to Iowa, to Manhattan, to every single range of small budget, high budget, you know, 300 million hits a month to 30,000 or 3,000 hits a month. You know, the full real range. And everyone's worried about performance, but one of the most important things is what's your definition, right? What does that actually mean to you? What is a well-performing site? Um, so a, f a couple of bad advice, I'm sure you've heard at points. Drupal is slow, right? Everyone, how many of you guys have heard that, right? I'm sure the rest of you have, to be honest. Drupal's big. I mean, it, it's a complex piece of software, but that doesn't mean it's slow, right? It, that, that has nothing to do with the speed of the system. Um, if it runs out of memory, give it more, right? Just make, put up more servers, just solve the problem that way. If you have that kind of luxury and you can just buy more servers and put them in, I'm very happy and very jealous. 
Uh, most people don't have that luxury to go just buy more servers whenever they're needed. Um, don't use CCK, views, panels, whatever module you want to put in there. All of these modules work fine. They're, you just have to know how to configure them and when to use them and when not to use them. There's very few modules that I would look at when I'm auditing a site and say, you should just take that out flat out. Um, very, very few cases that that actually exists, even for large modules like views or panels. Um, this last one I have a little asterisk next to. Varnish will solve all your problems. You'll probably hear that at some point, maybe today, maybe in the near future. It's kind of true, so uh, you'll hear it, and it's, it's not really the way to solve the Drupal problem, but it tends to make your bosses very happy and make your end users not really notice what's going on behind the scenes. So, so let's talk about the first set of tips, so evaluating modules. I'm glad this is kind of the first presentation of the day. I love doing the morning sessions because um, you guys are still awake. You know, I see most of you guys still have coffee. No one's slunching back in their chair, already asleep. So um, I think I have you guys' attention. Um, so evaluating modules is, in my opinion, one of the top skills you can have in Drupal. I mean, there's what, 9,000 modules? I don't know, something, somewhere around that ballpark right now. You can't really go through them one by one and read what each one does, look at the code, install it. It just doesn't make sense. Um, so these are the top five things that I look at in order. So the most important thing to me is obviously supported versions. You know, that's kind of a yes, no, pretty easy check. If you're on Drupal 7, there's not a Drupal 7 version, probably want to move along. Um, the second thing to me is actually maintain a reputation. This is a little harder to figure out as a beginner, just because you're, you don't really know these names yet. But to me, it's the most important thing about a module itself. So you know that some particular contributor writes really good code, you've used other modules they've created. I feel like that's more important than necessarily just number of, mod number of sites using it. Um, primarily like Ken that gave the keynote, you know, those are the type of people that I would look in a module and say, you know, it may have less users, but I trust this person more than this code necessarily. Um, so I think that's a really valuable thing to keep an eye on is as you're building out more and more sites and you start seeing names over and over, just kind of take note of that. Take note of who maintains the modules, who's helping you out, who's, you know, who's really trying to benefit Drupal, your site, the whole community. Um, and then there's total usage. I think just looking at this big number here that says, like this is for views, so I think it's what, like a couple hundred thousand, 400,000, something like that. Um, that's obviously the single easiest thing to check for. One has 40,000, one has four, even 4,000, right? That's a huge difference. Once you're talking about order of magnitude differences, that's actually significant. Um, the fourth thing I look for, which is kind of tricky, is number of open issues. So this doesn't really say anything about the module itself, but it could say that the maintainers abandon it. It may not be active. There may be a lot of people that are just confused about how it works. Um, so it's really important to look at that and just kind of see, is this something that there's actually bigger problems out there that there's a lot of people like me trying to get questions answered and can't get answered. Um, and the last thing that I think very few people look at is most people see this big number here, how many sites use it. There's a little link next to it that says view usage statistics. And it gives you this nice big colorful graph of how the usage has actually changed over time. And this is really cool because especially for like the whole lifespan of Drupal 7, if a module is the only option at the beginning, a lot of people are going to use it. But later on, if there's a better option that comes out of it, that you're going to see that one kind of upswing and the other either stay flat or go down. So this raw number here is very important, but this is maybe just as important to see, is this getting better? Is this getting worse? Is there a better option out there? Kind of look at how that chart's actually trending. It's really useful, and I think a lot of people just don't realize it's there. So when we're evaluating these modules for performance, once we've already decided and say, sure, this is a module that looks good, I can trust it, I'm not concerned, what do we actually do to say, is this module going to perform well or what's possible? 
Um, the first thing I look at is anytime before you install a module, you should get a good sense of how your site's behaving, whether that's a raw number or even it's just a feeling of browsing around a site before you enable and work on that new module. It's really helpful to know where you came from, right? It's really helpful to do that so that when you add that new module, you're not just lost and know, was it the module I just added? Was it something I did a week ago? Was it, someone, some, was it something someone else did two days ago? Um, you know, the theme that you'll probably hear over and over from me is, if you're really worried about performance, you can't think about performance in terms of, this feels slow, or this feels fast. It's really hard to deal with performance if you're not actually quantifying, or at least doing some sort of basic numbers to actually figure out how your site's working. Um, one nice trick also for performance is in the issue queues, there's actually a tag that, especially bigger modules will use, the performance tag. And this is to signify any kind of issue that relates directly to improving the performance of a module. If you search for performance, you'll get a lot of these, my, slide, my site is slow, please try and help me kind of messages. If you use a performance tag, most of that will actually relate to really fixing the module. So that's a nice little trick to don't search for performance, look at the performance tag instead. So here's some other questions to ask when you're actually evaluating these modules. And these are, I think, some of the most important ones that, again, I think people get the, how many of you guys have heard the term module buffet? Can't remember where I heard that from, but you, know, you have all these thousands of modules out there. It's all one cost free, which is great. So you just can go out there, get three or 400 modules, put it on your site, and now you have no idea what's happened. I actually worked on a site, no joke, that had over 500 modules installed. And they couldn't tell me what two-thirds of them did. So it's really easy to buy into that and say it's, you know, you download it, you install it, and you could forget about the next six months. So these are really key questions to kind of ask yourself. First of all, when does this module run? This is the most important thing when you're evaluating a module for performance. Is this something that's gonna run selectively, like on cron or something in the background? Is this something that's gonna run every time content's updated, every time a user's updated, every single page load? And that's something you can really conceptualize without knowing too much about the module, right? You think about something like views or panels, that's controlling one page, right? If you go to that page, it could slow it down. If you go to a different page, maybe not. If you download a module that changes how users log in, again, that's kind of obvious. It's, you know when that's gonna affect your site. Um, so definitely that's the first question to ask yourself when looking at modules. Um, how does this scale? Meaning, is this something that sweeps across all of your content, all of your users, or one user, one piece of content at a time? Really simple question. Is this once per person, or is this once per everything? What happens if it fails? Um, this is a question that even goes beyond performance. This is a question that really goes to stability of a site. If you see this great module out there that not many people are using, and you use it for one cool little JavaScript-y type effect on your site, and it fails, the site still works, doesn't affect performance, nothing happens. If you put in some new module that tries to do some external web services or something weird when users log in and it fails, guess what, no one can log in. And if they could, it's gonna be really slow. So you have to look at if it fails, how's that actually gonna impact my site? Does my site care about performance? This may sound a little weird, but if you really think about how all the different sites you guys probably work on, if you have some sort of internal site for a group of 10 people, do you really wanna spend the time trying to get it down to two seconds a page or half a second a page? It doesn't make a lot of sense. If it's all anonymous, it doesn't make much sense either. But if it's something that people are logging in or it's high traffic, you actually wanna keep in mind what type of time do I wanna spend on this? Um, you know, I, I see a lot of internal sites that maybe 10, 15 people use, and people spend all kinds of time and money trying to optimize it, and their public site that has two million hits a month, they say, oh, well, we haven't gotten to that yet. Doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, so definitely look at it in terms of priority. Slow is not always bad. It could just be farther down in that never-ending to-do list. 
Um, and last, do I really need this module? This is how you end up with 500 modules on your site, is I enable this module because I thought I needed it at some point. I never revisit it. Now it's just sitting around. So when you have a, mod when you have a performance problem, what are you actually looking for? How are you actually going to solve this problem? So the first thing is, when does it occur? Right? Similar to evaluating modules, same concept. Is my site slow at very particular times of day? Um, certain actions are being performed. You know, when does that slowness happen? If someone emails you and say, hey, the site seems slow right now, are they logged in? Are they creating content? Are they looking at reports? You know, what does that mean? So that's the number one thing. When did it start? Um, so we'll kind of come back to this in, in a minute, but if you can look at your site and say the home page two months ago took one second, a month ago it took 1.2 seconds, now it's taking 1.5, you know and you can see that that slowdown didn't start yesterday. It started progressively over time. So it's really key that even if it's just an Excel document that you go in once a week, write home page two seconds, home page 1.1 seconds, whatever it is, that's immensely useful once a problem happens because you can narrow it down to what modules could have caused it and what issues could have happened. Um, and also, who's to blame? So one thing here that I think is really key about, especially when you're working in a development team, is when you get a bug and you kind of put the bug back out, right, or there's a performance feature that goes back out, it's really easy to just say, you know, I, I ran to an issue, this page is slow. But if you have some sort of accountability to know who to go back to, they can tell you a lot more about what they did, what was actually configured. So this is more of kind of a personal way to manage the problem. But if you know who did it, there's some sort of mark on the page or mark in code that tells you what happened, that's just as useful as when did it start. Because ultimately, it's going to be harder for you to figure out the problem than go to the person that in some way caused the problem. So from my experience, these are kind of the four main areas where performance issues actually happen. Um, number one are what I call page building modules. So views, panels, display suite, I'm sure you guys can name plenty of others similar to that. If it's taking over the whole execution of the page, guess what? That's going to stop everything while it's working. So if it's complicated or not, cr not implemented correctly, it's just going to sit there and spin until that's done. That's the number one biggest thing performance, uh, number one problem where performance issues occur. Um, external web services. If people are logging in via Facebook, if people are logging in via some internal single sign-on tool, or every time someone logs in, you're noting that in some other system, definitely the next biggest thing. Um, because anything that's external, you're not just talking about those really quick web server to database chatting back and forth. It could be something that takes half a second just to get a result back. Overall complexity. So, you know, this is the one I see a lot. You know, number of modules everyone's seen. This one, you'd be amazed how many times I see that where someone built a panel, someone else came along and said, well, I need that same thing. And they put the panel in there. And then someone else needs a view, so they put that in the panel. And by the time you end up, you have like 15 views and four panels on one page. Even if that's cached to the high heavens, <laughs> the site still, that's a lot of stuff happening. Um, so that's a, just looking at how a page is built in terms of the number of layers is also a really big key important con um, key aspect. Um, and just misconfigured components. So, you know, this is kind of that big miscellaneous category of I could list 40 more things, but I'll be lazy and list one more. Um, just simple things like I forgot to turn on page caching. I forgot to turn on block caching. Um, you know, these are the kind of things that as you're a, a newer site builder, you just kind of forget from time to time. As you get used to site building, this last 80% just kind of falls in where, you know, anonymous is slow. Oh, wait, I forgot page caching. You know, you just kind of pick the rest is 80% up. 
And it, it, so managing performance, this, if there's nothing else you take from this whole presentation, this is a slide I want everyone to focus on, is what does performance mean to you and how is that actually fixing your problem, right? Keep records of performance over time. This is why I said Excel documents, something simple, emails. You know, it doesn't matter how you do it, but if you can just look at month by month how fast are pages, you'd be amazed how much easier that makes troubleshooting. I mean, it just changes completely night and day. Um, when are modules enabled? When are modules disabled? When did, was there a huge spike in user traffic? You guys are already exchanging these emails with people. Just write it down somewhere where you can actually keep a record of it. It's just amazing what kind of difference that makes. Um, establish a performance metric. This is something I'd say almost no client have ever had actually had something they could point to and say, this is fast for us. This is our definition of fast. I mean, you should be able to say with pretty good certainty, 80% of pages should come back from Drupal in half a second or completely render in three seconds. Whatever the numbers are, it's unique to every project. That's really important because it shows you if you're within that metric, yes, you're good. If you're not, no, you're, you, know, you need to work on it. So much of performance is people fighting back and forth. Of, it feels slow. It feels fast. And if 95% of the users are seeing it in less than two seconds or you know, there's some number there to shoot for, if there's one off page that happens to be slow, you really can't do anything about that you know, at a certain point. Um, so you know, I think everyone for your site, you should have some sort of definition like this. Some percentage of pages should return from Drupal in X milliseconds and render in X seconds. You know, that's something you guys should just be able to tell. If you ever have an external person work on the site or a new person come into the project, that should be front and center on your whole performance plan. Um, adopt a definition of done. This is actually something that's changed a lot in the Drupal community that um, Ken actually touched on a little bit with user test or unit testing and some of the other QA work that's going on. If someone implements a view and it's performing slowly, it's not done, right? It may work, but they're not done with that work. So this is more of a little bit more of a project management sort of aspect to throw in there. But looking at performance as just part of the development helps from building a site four months, get to that fourth month and realize you have to go back and change a lot of stuff. You know, it's really easy to just say during QA when you're testing something, if it's slow, it's not done. Push it back, get it redeveloped, and finally get it fixed later. Um, so really sticking to that makes a huge difference. Um, don't hide behind infrastructure, that's you know, common. Um, you know, again, if you have the money, bless you. <laughs> um, so this section I want to throw in for, uh, so actually let me take a step back. Um, I have a lot of stuff in these slides. It's all in SlideShare. If you guys are taking notes, you know, I appreciate it, but I'd rather you guys be thinking about questions and kind of coming up with questions. Um, I'd rather kind of overload you guys with this session. And then if you have any questions, you can feel free to reach out to me on Twitter or something like that. So there's a lot of stuff in here that I think's good. Hopefully you guys do. <laughs> um, so types of caches, if you're a site builder, you probably don't think about caching outside of what page and block, right? Those are probably the only two you've ever considered. Um, but when you're talking about performance in Drupal, it's really key to understand that if something's cached, it's fast. If something's not cached, it's slow. Pretty easy to make those kind of comparisons. Um, so what are the types of caches? There's what I call application level caching. So these, this is the caching you don't really see, right? This is the, you know, something's not showing up, clear the cache. It's that sort of exchange. Um, you know, a menu item's not showing up. A filtered output, a particular path. Oh, I have filter in there twice, that's awesome. Um, you know, these are the kind of things really core to Drupal that you probably don't touch other than just clearing it out completely. And these are also the, you can't really configure these. You can't really add performance to this. So this is that baseline levels of caches that probably doesn't affect you day to day. 
The next level up from that, kind of closer to the visual part of the site, is what I call component level caching. So this is views, panels, blocks, parts of a page that you're actually seeing and working on. And this is really the biggest key for authenticated users. If someone's anonymous, they're going to get the whole page rendered anyways. If they're authenticated, this is the place where they're going to see slowness. Slow views, slow panels, slow blocks, whatever it is. Um, so this is really key because if, someone's, if a page hasn't been rendered or they're authenticated and you haven't optimized views and panels and whatever else, there's nothing below that that's going to save you. Right? Each one of these levels is kind of independent. Um, another key is how are these actually cached? So just to point out a couple things, like blocks are cached as actual text. There's nothing being re-rendered. Drupal just goes to a database, gets a chunk of HTML, sticks it in the page. It's extremely efficient. Something like a view or a panel, it's still this big PHP object thing that it has to unwrap, actually work on, and put on the page. Um, so there's different levels of effectiveness. But the key is component level, authenticated users, that's the main purpose. And then, of course, page level is for anonymous users. It's pages that are the same for everyone. Um, as long as everything's cached and they're all anonymous, you shouldn't ever really run into performance issues. If you are, there's probably something pretty serious going on. Um, one nice little trick that I think a lot of people don't know about in Drupal 6 um, is what's called fast path caching. Um, you can't do this with the regular Drupal database easily. But what this basically does is if an anonymous user comes into your site, comes into Drupal, this will actually send the page out before much happens in Drupal. So it's literally just a method of caching, so it's a lot faster than usual. Um, this exists also in Drupal 7. Um, but in Drupal, in, there's really other ways to cache pages to make them more efficient. But this is a nice little trick that I think most people don't know about. So like the, the memcache module, I think, supports it and a lot of other tools. But fast path is the, the term to kind of look into it. So configuring Drupal. So what are some of the top things you can do physically on your site to actually change how Drupal's performing? The number one thing is, I, mean, I think page caching goes without saying. I'm not sure it's even on here. Um, there's no real reason not to use that. If they're anonymous, you're not displaying anything special for them. There's no real reason not to cache pages. Um, caching blocks is really key. Um, because of authenticated users, this is one of the best things you can do for your site for performance. Um, out of the box, it gets disabled by node access. So by node access, I mean organic groups, taxonomy access control, uh, content access, all those types of modules. If those are turned on, you can't use block caching. It's not, it's not something to say don't use those modules, but if you don't really need them, you're losing a big performance gain that's possible. So you know, if you need it, you need it. If you don't, make sure those aren't enabled and not in use, because it's actually affecting your site. Um, Content changes, this is one that I'm always amazed that, you know, I'll run to some big site that's doing all kinds of crazy stuff, and this is one of the kind of deep, dark secrets of Drupal, is every time you update content, if you have nothing specially configured, the block cache and the page cache disappears. It gets completely wiped out. So to prevent that, just looking at Drupal as a web server database, no other tools involved, this little minimum cache lifetime saves that from happening. So if you're on a site where people are updating content every few minutes, block cache and page cache are basically doing nothing for you. Um, this minimum cache lifetime basically says, if I created this page, I created this block five minutes ago. I don't want anyone to clear this out for the next 15 minutes, no matter what happens. That's basically what this means. So it's really helpful so that you don't get these mass wipes that happen when you update content. So it even goes down to, I think, one minute, which if you have a lot of content updates, that's, that's a pretty big difference. Um, so using a reverse proxy. So how many of you guys know what that is? I'm not sure. Okay, quarter of you. 
Um, this option right here is pretty much only important if you have a reverse proxy. If you don't know what it is and you're not using it, you can completely ignore it. If you do know what it is, this is the longest that that external service can hold your page, whether that's a CDN or Varnish or some tool. If you set this to 30 minutes, it'll, it won't check back for you for 30 minutes unless you've done sort of some sort of integration. So the minimum cache lifetime is really designed so that to prevent anything from happening in this amount of time and applies primarily to using your database as kind of the source of everything. Once you're up to this level, you're sort of assuming there's external stuff involved. Um, so the definition of these two, I think the help text in here is a little tricky if you're not sure exactly what everything actually means in there. Um, but the first one primarily think about for Drupal ca for database caching. The next one, if you're using something else, it's there's a little more to it, but that's really the easiest way to think about the two. Um, bandwidth optimization. This is one that is a huge difference on the front end side. So everyone's seen in Drupal, you install a site and you see, what, let's say 40 CSS and JavaScript files. It's great for development because you have all these little tiny snippets you can just change all over the place. But it's horrible for, for a browser because they only download you know, usually two to four files at a time. If you have 50, 60 files to download, they're gonna spend a lot of time just waiting, getting new files. So just these little check boxes will get it all the way down to usually three or four in Drupal 7. Um, one trick is, it says only on production. Good luck trying to debug that if you have that turned on in your local environment, because you're gonna get all one giant file and it's just gonna be hard to work through. Um, so a nice thing you can do is in your settings PHP file where all those database settings go, if you're on your production environment, you can just set this. So rather than worrying about features or any sort of complicated way to pass variables back and forth, you can put that in your settings PHP file and it'll just turn it on. So same thing, you can replace CSS with JS and works the same way. Um, so just a really helpful little tip instead of um, so that you can have it just on production and not disrupt your other environments. Um, Fast 404 is a good, is really, really important for a lot of reasons. If you have a Drupal 7 or Drupal 6 site and you don't have anything kind of specially set up, every single 404 goes into Drupal. So if you have an old site that has a whole bunch of old URLs that are still linked to from elsewhere, Drupal's trying to serve every single one of those, whether they're images or pages or CSS files or whatever it is. Um, it makes a huge performance issue for Drupal. This was added in Drupal 7.9, and there, there's a patch for Drupal 6. I'm not positive it's in yet or what the status of it is, but it basically says if someone tries to request a JavaScript file that I don't think I own, just send a 404. Like, don't try to regenerate it. Don't do anything to try and access that. Um, it's on by default, but I think this is another thing that we're looking at code, but it's an important concept to understand. If you're sitting on Drupal 7.7, 7, 7.8, 7, 7, 7.6, something like that, this is a pretty good reason to, to jump up a few versions. So a couple other Drupal notes specifically. Understand what Drupal does and does not cache. So it helps you understand when things, when to troubleshoot certain issues. So Drupal will cache you know, the menu system, right? Unless you tell it to get rid of it, it's gonna be there. Whereas something like a view, if you haven't done anything to actively cache that, it's not gonna cache at all. So you kinda have to know what's Drupal gonna do for you, what's your responsibility, and weigh those two and know where you're actually gonna fix the problem. Don't enable UI modules on production. There's so many reasons why this is true, but there's a lot of code in there that gets loaded up and just sits. But there's plenty of other reasons, like if the UI module's not enabled, no one can go mess it up on production. Like no one can go edit views, no one can go edit 
rules or fields or whatever. So there's plenty of like management reasons to do it. Um, but just looking at it from a performance standpoint for this talk, it just, it's a lot of files to just not have to worry about loading. It's just a nice thing to just take away some strain. Um, avoid database logging. How many of you guys have heard this before? This one, some people, I don't, controversial is kind of a, a little bit of a grave word to put here, but the reason database logging exists in Drupal is because it's designed to be a web server and a database, and that's all you ever need. So the database logging built into Drupal is really efficient because you create the log, you go to the back end, you look at all the logs. It's really straightforward to get there. But if you have bad PHP code, if you have weird stuff that's happening on your site, that's pounding your database, writing those errors, writing those warnings out. Um, that's, uh, that's one of the biggest things if you have like a, a dev module or something that's really misbehaving, it can be writing hundreds of things to your database on every request. A dozen's probably more realistic, but I've seen hundreds. Um, and that's a huge performance slowdown. Um, so if you have a larger infrastructure, if you have a good infrastructure ops team to work with, using something else to log, like syslog or log for PHP, which is a you know, shout out for my own module, um, is a way to maintain, you have all the logs in one place to look at it and get to it and view it, but it's happening outside of the scope of Drupal. So it's gonna be much more efficient and much faster. And the last thing, and this is really one of the issues in PHP that makes it kind of a joke to other languages, which I'm sure everyone's heard jokes about how bad PHP is. Um, if there's an error in PHP, it actually still slows down the site, whether it's being printed or not. Because if you think about it, it's going through the code saying, oh, you shouldn't be doing this. Should I be printing this out or just let it go? You know, there's still like execution, there's still weird stuff going on there. So if you have bad code, that could actually be affecting the performance of your site, whether you see it or not. So if you're doing custom code, it's really important to follow PHP's coding standards, Drupal's coding standards, turn errors all the way up on your development or QA or you know, non-production environments. Um, it actually causes a significant slowdown. And it's really hard to troubleshoot um, because it's so core to, to PHP it looks like nothing's happening, it just looks like something's slow. So that's a really key tip for, uh, especially if you have custom development from other developers or you've done some yourself. So let's talk about a couple of performance related tools. A couple for Drupal, a couple more service oriented. So th these first three are kind of high level modules for Drupal. Um, Devel is really the first one, I'm sure most of you guys have heard of it at least, whether you use it or not. Um, from a site builder's perspective, it gives you three key pieces of information. How long it took the page to render, which goes in your spreadsheet. How much memory was used, goes in your spreadsheet, it's two numbers. How many queries were run, that's your third number. It just prints it out right at the bottom of the screen, take it, put it in your spreadsheet, you don't have to think about it for another week or month. It just puts it right there for you. Um, really great for getting those sort of really basic diagnostics and seeing how things change over time. So early on in the presentation, if I said, oh, we'll figure out how much memory it's using, figure out how long it's taking to use Drupal, it's easy to do. <laughs> I don't wanna scare you off. Um, the develop module, just prints it, bottom of the page, scroll down, it's right there for you, it's all you need. Um, the boost module, this does page caching f in the file system. The reason this was designed, and part of why I want to bring it out here is just because it's a common enough module that people are going to run into. The reason it was designed is so that people can have a really efficient page caching on shared hosting. So if you have your own infrastructure, you have really good de uh, ops guys, infrastructure guys, Boost is probably not actually for you. Boost is if you don't have access to other services, it's primarily if you're on shared hosting or you don't have control over that server. If that is the case, it's much better than Drupal 
Drupal's built in page caching. It's good. But just key, I just want to, the reason I bring it up is just that real easy distinction of if you see it, it's good if you have shared hosting. If you have control, there's much better options. Um, Memcache is another one we'll talk about in another minute, but um, the Drupal module, the key is a second bullet point. It stores it in memory, not in the database, so your database is doing less work. That's, it's transparent, that's the key thing you need to know. That's all you really need to know about how it works. So a couple of Drupal modules that actually work with Drupal. Just kind of highlights, there are obviously other ones, but these are the ones that I really look for and use most often. Um, Entity Cache is fantastic for Drupal 7. I hope this is just in core in Drupal 8. So the idea here is if you have big, complicated nodes, you know, let's say you have 15 fields, 20 fields, Entity Cache will save that as one object so that you can just reload it. Rather than going to the database and picking out every little field again and loading all that up, it just saves as one little bundle that you can just go and retrieve quickly. You literally turn it on, zero configuration, you'll never see it in your Drupal site. It doesn't, there's nothing there. You just turn it on. Um, I run it on every site I touch on Drupal 7. I've never run into an issue. If that piece of content gets updated, the cache entry gets cleared out. Completely transparent, no stale data. Um, I don't see any reason not to use it. Um, especially if you have 12, 15, 20 fields on a content type, you know, big, complex content types. Um, path cache is great for Drupal 6, Drupal 7's in the works. Um, when you go to a Drupal page, you see tons of little menu links in Drupal's menu and the footer and the header and the sidebar. Those are actually not just links. Every one of those is looking up permissions, looking up aliases, looking up all kinds of stuff. That's not cached in a very efficient way. This module just makes that more efficient. Again, it works the same way as Entity Cache. You turn it on, it's just kind of there. Real quick win. Um, block Cache Alter, this is a really, really clever module. So when I say block caching is the best thing you can do for authenticate users, it's accurate, but what will really frustrate you is there's a lot of blocks that aren't cached by default. Like some of the user blocks, um, like that user block you see that says my account and log out and that, that little one, that's not actually cached it's because, well, for whatever reason. <laughs> um, so what Block Cache Alter does is it just takes your block page you already have and it just adds one little drop down at the bottom. Again, really simple, you put it on, it's as effective as you want it to be. So if someone has that little user block and you know that's always the same for that user regardless of where they are, there's an option to cache that per user. It's a whole lot better than not caching it at all. Um, so all that does is gives you that extra little drop down to set that value. Really simple. Um, there are, just as a side note, I know there are issues with block cache alter in like certain versions of Drupal core. It's all on that project page, but um, yeah, that's a, that's a really good one for block cache heavy pages, uh, you know, authenticated pages, that sort of thing. A Couple other Drupal modules, views light pager. If you have really big views or really big content tables and your view is slow and you just can't figure out why, turn off the pager. If it gets a lot faster, use light pager. That's the troubleshooting there. Um, it goes into how the database is stored and how all the rows are calculated and everything. It's not really that important. Really big data, turn it off the pager, see if it's faster. If it is, look at light pager. Three steps. Um, views content cache and cache actions are great for this reason right here. Clear a view display when a new article node is created. So rather than saying 15 minutes, that's a completely arbitrary time and really kind of worthless. So between 9 p.m. at night and 5 a.m., it's still regenerating every 15 minutes. Does that really make sense to anyone? Um, so what Views Content Cache does is only cache this when something else happens. 
like this content type, someone creates a new one, or someone posts a comment, or a new user is created, that sort of thing. Um, really great to do, it's basically doing reactive caching instead of proactive, if that makes sense. Um, cache actions, same thing, but not view specific. It's the only real difference. It, it uses the rules module, which is, I think, one of my favorite modules, but it's really confusing. <laughs> like the UI, there's, it's a rules engine. How hard could it be, right? A um, couple third-party tools. So web optimization tools. Yahoo's, no matter what you want to say about the company and all that, has incredible developer tools. Smush it is a really cool tool that you upload an image to it and it gives you back an optimized image. It doesn't take away, it doesn't make it more grainy, it doesn't create more loss in the photo. It takes out stuff like the metadata of when it was created. Or it takes out anything having to do with just solid white or solid black and optimizes that. It can really get you legitimately 20 to 30% less file size on images, up to, I've seen, 60 or 70. So really, it, that's all it is. Upload, it gives you a new one, use that one instead, period. Sprite me, how many of you guys know what CSS sprites are? So, okay, good amount. Um, this is a really cool tool. How many of you guys have heard of this? Okay, so less of you. Um, you basically, it's a little bookmarklet you install in your browser. You click it and it goes, here's your site. These are the sprites you should create. Would you like me to create them for you? Okay, here's the CSS to use. It's really, really cool. Um, it's not completely foolproof, still need to test, but it gets you I don't know, 80, 90% of the way there, and then you just trick after that. Um, if you don't know what CSS sprites are and you're really keen on CSS and JavaScript and front end performance, it's, gonna, it'll, it's really, really cool and really beneficial. Um, if you look at like Google's homepage, there's really only one image that makes up every single one of the icons on the page. Um, makes a huge performance difference. Uh, web testing tools. So web page test is great for how slow is a site, another way to get that simple metric of what's that number of how slow my site is. Uh, Google page speed online, same idea. Um, on the browser side, Firebug, YSlow, PageSpeed. Um, Firebug, more the developer side, YSlow and PageSpeed. You look at a site, you run the test, and it tells you what you should do to optimize that page. You know, combine images, combine CSS, whatever it is. Um, the whole purpose is all these tools are pretty much hands off until you need them. Um, and then these last two SaaS products are pretty cool. Um, New Relic is an amazing tool. New Relic is it monitors not just the end user performance, but actually the Drupal performance as well. So it can actually tell you if your site took 400 milliseconds to load, it'll say 200 was spent in the database, 100 was spent in PHP, 100 was spent on this particular external web service, this much was spent in memcache. Like it breaks out the whole execution in this nice graphical way. Um, the free plan is more than enough for most sites. So, and it goes up to, it's like 50 bucks a server or something. It's not exorbitant, but the free plan is more than enough for most people. Um, fantastic service. Um, Yoda is more of a front end performance test. Um, you can kind of think of it, if you look at web page test or if you know what that is already, Yoda is just a way to monitor that performance over time. It's a simpler tool. Um, to be honest, it's good, but uh, if you had to pick, New Relic's really the place to go for if you want external service. And the other great thing about something like New Relic is it has this cool index that says, if my site is going above this number, it's performing well. If it's not, it's doing poorly. Something you can just show your managers and be like, see, it's good. You told me this was the number, so it's good now. Um, it, it's really graphical, really simple for quantifying performance and actually understanding what's good, what's not. Okay, what time do we have? Okay, um, so let's make this interactive. Let's take a vote. Who wants to know what varnish and memcache and all that is? Who wants to ask questions? So, infrastructure, no one? 
Questions? Oh, come on. I can't. That's not quorum, people. Let's try this again. Infrastructure. Okay. Questions? Every person with a coffee in front of them should be raising their hand. No excuses. <laughs> All right. Um, I'll spend a couple minutes, just talk through infrastructure, and then we'll go to questions. So web server, most important part, least you can actually optimize. OK? Apache, 90 plus percent of what you guys are going to deal with. Nginx, watch for the future. So it scales horizontally and vertically, meaning more web servers, good. Bigger web servers, good. Both of those. PHP, or application server, as Java people like to call it. Um, it usually runs within Apache itself, which is not the most efficient way. But again, that's how most people do it. Works perfectly fine. Um, always use APC. 10 20% right out of the box. Really slick. Um, and recently, it can actually run for you Java ASP types out there. Um, it can actually run as a completely separate process now. So you can scale it independently of the web servers. Just a cool little trick. Uh, MySQL database server. Everyone knows MySQL. How many of you guys know either of these two? OK. Both of those are alternatives to MySQL. They're compatible. They're arguably faster. This is a new project by the guy that originally started this. I trust that. <laughs> um, Drupal itself is actually tested against MariaDB. So if you're using MariaDB or MySQL, Drupal doesn't care. Both of them are going to work just as well. Um, if you have MySQL and you don't have any reason to look elsewhere, stick with it. If you're curious, if you just want to know what's out there, both of these have really kind of interesting stories and why they are what they are. If it helps, these are the press flows of MySQL, if that analogy helps. It's MySQL plus some performance stuff. Caching server. Now, later. <laughs> um, Memcache, what everyone uses now, it's great, does its job. Redis has so many more benefits, and it's going to be the popular one before too awfully long. Um, Memcache works. If it works, it works. You know, leave it. Varnish, reverse proxy, makes all, your, makes all the magic happen, makes all the bad things go away. Um, user comes to the reverse proxy that has the page, sends it back. Never talks to Drupal, never slows anything down. If it doesn't have the page, goes to Drupal, stores it there so it doesn't have to talk to Drupal again. They're like, it's like a love-hate relationship. It's glad it has Drupal. But it doesn't really need it. It's perfectly fine on its own. It's independent. It doesn't need Drupal. Um, it's great. Varnish can handle well upwards three, 4,000 requests a second. If you can do that out of Drupal, I am very impressed with you. Varnish is very killer for huge sites. We have five minutes. All right, questions. Where do you find me? Eric Webb, everything, Twitter. LinkedIn. This is already on SlideShare, so you can get back to it later. Um, like I said, I have a few minutes for questions, and I'll go outside for anyone else has questions. Um, the key thing is I want you to look at this on SlideShare. These slides are up there right this second if you go look at it. If you have questions, reach out to me on Twitter. I don't mind clarifying, answering questions, whatever it is. Um, I try to do that for all my presentations. It's the best way to kind of communicate with people long term. Um, if you email me, it will get lost. Just saying. <laughs> um, but I have other presentations on SlideShare. I'm happy to provide any feedback information. Um, so I talk a lot in an hour. I don't even have coffee. Look at this. It's not alcohol either. Code of conduct. Um, so any questions while I still have my voice? No? No questions. All right. Yeah. So you mentioned the, uh, the node access module, the context access module, the access module. Um, module. Um, do you need to use some kind of node access module? Is there one that's better for performance? Do you have any like, recommendations? Um, I'd say the, as a whole, something like content access. What? 
oh, sorry. Um, of the content access modules, because they disable block caching, what's the best for performance? I think that goes to those other questions we asked about how to evaluate a module. Like content access is pretty lightweight because it applies to individual pieces of content. Something like organic groups is gonna check, are you a member of this group? Is this content in this group? Is this content private? Is, like it checks a lot more things. So I would say it falls in perfectly in line with all those other questions you would be thinking about. Uh, no, um, I, I, it's similar to New Relic, right? Same idea, it kind of tracks. It, it just kind of tracks the performance, or is it page speed online? Okay, it, it's actually the same as the browser um, test. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so using the page speed service on Google. Um, it's, there's a couple different services that do that similar kind of thing, and if I remember correctly how Google's works, it basically either optimize, it, you, traffic goes through Google to your site, and it optimizes kind of as it comes back out. Um, most, way, most ways websites are set up, they do their own caching and their own thing that Google's doing. Um, personally, if I had if I wanted all of my traffic to go back and forth between Google, I would just work on the page itself being optimized. So, I, I mean, it's helpful, but I'm not sure it's some, I wouldn't really depend on my site doing well for the sake of Google doing it for me. So, all right, so that's actually time. So I guess we can keep asking questions until the next presenter's up here. Is that good? Um, oh, the attendee survey. Okay. Okay, where are these outside? Okay. Um, there's an attendee survey about the Linux Fest. Um, you know, what you thought about the event as a whole, some demographics information. Um, they're right outside if you guys would, wouldn't mind completing those after this talk before the next rousing Drupal talk in 15 minutes or so. Um, Looks like this. So just pick one of those up outside. It's always beneficial for a camp like this to know what people actually think about, to know how to make it better. Um, so that's really important. So any other questions before everyone runs? Uh, go here. For, I'm sorry? Yeah, so, so the question is when someone updates a piece of content, does all of the caching clear? By default, it does. Because Drupal wants to make sure there's no stale content. So it's designed for a smaller site where that's not happening all the time. That one setting changes that whole behavior. So it's really easy to, to mitigate that and fix that issue. Just by default, it leans towards no stale content versus forcing people to do some sort of configuration to make it work differently. So by default, yes, it clears everything. That one little drop down changes that entire behavior. I've been waiting on you, so. <laughs> Usually, yeah, I think the big thing is if you have a site that, I think the big difference probably between the type of sites you're working on is those are the company or those are like a main product of the company. Most sites where the site is kind of a, it's a marketing purpose or it's kind of a different function within the company, that's usually where the database is kind of a lot simpler and easier to work on. So I say that I always tell people MySQL is a natural bottleneck, meaning if that's the issue, you've probably done all the rest of the stuff correctly, more or less. But the web server is the one that you'll probably reach before anything else. So yeah, no, I think definitely for larger sites that changes a little bit. So, uh, you. Uh, 
Uh, speed comparison between WordPress and Drupal. Um, uh, that's a big question. <laughs> um, well, I mean, the hard thing is the way WordPress, WordPress fits kind of less use cases, but some of those use cases it does extremely well. Drupal is more of a general purpose framework. So we're, I think usually if you benchmark WordPress, you're benchmarking a blog or a basic CMS system. If you benchmark Drupal, you could be benchmarking a mapping application. I mean, it's like core to core, WordPress is faster because it's a smaller core. But once you look at a Drupal project versus a WordPress project, I think the range is, it really becomes apples to oranges once you go outside of a basic CMS implementation. So, last question, who gets it? Someone, ah, oh, there you go. Uh, any tips for a large Drupal Commons site? Um, I think looking at Memcache is a huge benefit for that whole authenticate user traffic issue. Um, block cache alter makes a big difference um, because on, or actually block cache because they're all groups. Um, let's see, I think definitely Memcache is the biggest one and the other thing with Commons I think is really unique to Commons versus just organic group space sites, which it essentially is, um, is Commons comes with a lot of functionality out of the box. You know, it's designed to be, you install it and you're pretty much good to go. Um, I'd say that's similar to most other distributions where there's a lot of stuff to start with and a lot of times you have to pare it back down to actually get to what you want. Um, Commons is a big one, like open publish, those kind of the same ideas where they're huge sites to start with by design, and often to do performance, you scale it back a little bit. But I'd say, you know, the memcache is the making sure views and panels are cached, making sure, um, you know, you really have to focus on that component level because the page level doesn't exist. Um, so I would say views caching is one of the biggest things you can do for that sort of, that sort of a site. Um, is that last question? All right, good. Thanks, everyone. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and, and fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, Everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. 
And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, this um, uh, hardware is going to fail, and CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it. Uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack, they were using it to transcode video, and I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the CloudStack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Astra Space Systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. 
will continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again.